Should I put my house in a trust? That's our topic for today as promised. One of the things we're going to talk about is the difference between a will and a trust. I know a lot of people kind of confuse the two. How does the process work? How to avoid probate? That's a big one. Various types of trusts and their purpose. How long does it take to complete the process and what does it cost? My goal is to help you minimize the expenses, minimize the time it takes to do and get you educated and more familiar with the whole process without actually going through the trouble to hire an attorney and paying for consultation. And because of that, I have my good friend of mine who's an attorney who practices in New York and New Jersey. His name is David Traster. He handles real estate, family law, wills, trusts, and I'm going to let David introduce himself. So welcome, David. <laughs> Thank you, Asphir, for having me back. I appreciate it. I like doing your show. I like being here, and I'm happy to share yeah, information you. uh, with your viewers, and hopefully they will find it informative. Uh, my name is David Traster. I'm an attorney in New York and New Jersey. I have offices in Bergen County, in Fort Lee, in New Jersey, and in New York City. Our practice consists of uh, real estate, co contracts, litigation, uh, immigration, divorces, and wills and trusts, which is something that we will talk about today. Yes, absolutely. And being in the real estate industry, I come across a lot of clients who inherited a home from their parents. Most of the time, the home is paid, there's there's no mortgage on it. And the first thing they wanna do mostly is sell the property. And when they start talking uh, about that particular thing and they, they're even interviewing realtors, they think they can put the house on the market, they find out that, oh, they have to go to probate. So my, uh, question is or I, what people want to know and I want to know is as a parent myself when I pass I'd like for my children to just take the house and do whatever they want to do enjoy the money or keep it or do whatever and then I want to make sure uh, that I protect myself and I know that a lot of our, uh, our um, viewers uh, have don't really know exactly how to set things up in a way where it becomes easy uh, after they're gone. So first and foremost, can you tell us what's the difference between a will and a trust? Sure. So a will is a document that you, uh, uh, that you draft while you're still alive, and you basically indicate what your wishes are upon your death. Who do you want to inherit your home, your bank accounts? Uh, maybe you have very valuable things in the family that have been passed down to generations that you want to keep in the family. You don't necessarily want to sell. Maybe it's an engagement ring that you want uh, a granddaughter to have or a daughter to have. So it stays in the family and that memory is preserved. That's generally a will. It only uh, it's drafted while a person is alive, and it uh, but it comes into a power when the person has passed. A trust. The best way to think about it of a trust is like a separate company or a separate legal entity. I use the word company because uh, companies have tax ID numbers. The trust has to have a tax ID number. How like a business. How companies have a CEO or a manager that. Uh, manages the company, the trusts have a trustee who's in charge of managing uh, the trust and making sure that uh, things are done properly, things are filed yearly, and things eventually get transferred to the beneficiaries of the trust. Okay, so how does this, because I've been in situations where there was a will but there was no trust. And then uh, the sequence of just putting a, uh, a property on the market and getting it sold turned out to be a whole big project. That is understandable and that is what happens. So the difference is that, you know, uh, that somebody who owns a home, let's say John Doe, 
owns you it. You like the, John Doe. Okay. I do like John. I'm a lawyer. We like John Doe okay. and Jane Doe. It's uh, well, I get into trouble when I have to think of a third one because I don't know that third <laughs> okay. one. But let's say John Doe owns a property. Chances are they own it in their individual name as John Doe. Mm -hmm. So now they have to transfer it to someone or they pass away and they have to, someone has to figure out what to do with that property. It becomes the estate of John Doe, and then there is someone who goes to the court to file, uh, to file the will and get appointed executor, and that person is in charge now of distributing the will, selling the home, and then distributing the proceeds however the John Doe wanted. With the trust, the property is already in the name of the trust while John Doe is alive. Okay. So he could call it John Doe Family Trust, and the, the trust then is transferred while John Doe is alive from John Doe as himself to John Doe Family Trust. So okay. it's transferred into the company that we call the trust. It's a, it happens by default when that's set up. It's not by default. We set up trust where people do with that trust. We don't get involved. It's none of my business what you okay. put in your trust, how much money right. you put in there. But people come to us and they say, hey, I'm John Doe. I have a trust. Can you transfer the property? Here's my deed. It's in my name. I want to transfer it into the name of the trust. So the benefit of that is that there is no waiting involved, meaning okay. John Doe passes. In the first scenario, John Doe passes with the will. Somebody has to go with that will to the court. They have to get appointed executor. They have to get letters of testamentary letters so that they could come to you as a realtor and say, look, it's fear. I have testamentary letters, I'm allowed to sell this home. And then however they distribute it, that's already their duty. That has nothing to do with you. The other one, a trustee comes to you and says, hey, Esfier, look, the, the home, this John Doe died, but John Doe is irrelevant already because we had the home in the name of the trust. So whether John Doe is alive or not is irrelevant. The trustee could really quickly turn that around. You don't have to go to court. You don't have to wait for these letters. It's a separate legal entity uh, from John Doe individually, and then they could turn that around very quickly. Okay, so when the trust is not in place yet, how long will it take to get the will into that stage? It varies. So to finish a probate takes months and months and months. But you as a realtor and many people who are in the business of buying and selling real estate, they don't care what happens to the estate. They don't care how the executor distributes the money from the sale of the house. That's their job. That's later on. They, they care about how do we list it? How do we sell it? And to do that, it usually takes a few weeks, maybe three to four weeks, sometimes a little less, depending on the courts, depending on where the court is loca located, to get testamentary letters that allows them to do that. But as you know, in real estate, every month, every week matters. You, you move, you know, there's a very different market in the spring and the start of uh, summer than there is at this time of the year in December. It, it doesn't take long, but it, with the trust, it's instantaneous. Okay. So what the probate by itself would be something that is going, the, it's going to have to happen regardless of how that was set up? Or can we avoid probate? Because I know probate court and hiring attorneys, and I know you're an attorney, <laughs> nothing personal, you're my friend, but uh, people don't want, you know, we try, the point is like, I would like for, for my viewers and my community and anybody else who, who's, who's watching this to have an idea of what, how to minimize the expenses and the headaches and the running around, because you know what, uh, you lose a family member, and it's great that, you know, they left you a home, but, but you are going through sadness, and you have to dig into personal items, and it's very painful, and a lot of people, um, you know, they, they go through a lot of emotions, so you, you, you don't want to keep them in that, you know, constant emotional roller coaster. So how do we minimize that? 
is probate really necessary or can we set it up in a way where there's no need for a probate court? Well, if you have a trust, that's one of the benefits of a trust is that it avoids probate. You don't need to go to probate if there's a trust. Now, some people have a will and a trust. They might have their home in a trust so that you can dispose of that quickly. And then they might have their bank accounts in a, not under the trust. They're in their own personal name and those that you have to go to probate for. Uh, so uh, trust generally is set up and it avoids the probate. It avoids this month and months and months long process where the executor has to show to the court how they, what kind of money they got, who they distributed it to before the process is closed off. Because a trust is its own separate legal entity, it continues living on even after the person is di uh, has died. It's so that's why I use the uh, analogy to a company because, right. you know, it's Apple- It's easier to understand, right. yeah. And Apple was owned by Steve Jobs. Steve mm -hmm. Jobs died, Apple carries on. Yeah. Uh, nothing had to be done from that regard. So same thing with the trust. The trust carries on based on the wishes of the person who set it up and the trustee determines when it's uh, to be distributed. Now maybe uh, you, you said that the person who dies generally just wants the house to be sold off. That's not always the case from what I see. Sometimes they want one of their children, maybe they have three children, and one child, two children are married with families and one is not. And they want that child to live in the home, you know, without rent, without anything, because they don't have a family and they could keep it that way. But they don't want to leave the home just to that one child. They want to split right. it evenly between all three children. So they might set it up in a trust where the person is, the trustee allows the one of the children to live in the home until that child dies or for a period of time, and then it's distributed. So it's all, it's its own separate entity, and it's controlled separate from everything else based on the trust agreement that was set up. So is there a specific type of trust? Because I've heard of like uh, in living trust and So then yeah, so there's, I think New York recognizes something like 26 different types of trusts. Of we, course, we, New York will make it difficult. We don't do <laughs> them all. The, the trusts that we generally see are revocable trusts, which is the most common, which is the living trust, what you uh, specified, where a person would set up a trust. They would say wh how they want that trust managed, meaning maybe they put in money in there, and they're the trustee, and they could distribute the money while they're alive, however they see fit, and then they appoint an alternative trustee after they're dead, and uh, what uh, they want that trustee to do. So that trustee might distribute money right away. Maybe that uh, trustee invests money. Maybe there's minors involved and you need to keep that money for their education and well-being. And this is a very popular question we get. When should I give the money to my kids, right? Because legally a child is an adult at 18 years old. If you ask most parents, should, something happened to me, do I want my 18 year old to come into all this money? The answer is no. And then you get into a question, well, what's a proper time? Is it college graduation? Not everybody goes to college. Grandpa and grandma age. <laughs> <laughs> right. So uh, there's a lot of consideration. Yeah. There is no standard. Some people do 25, some people do 30. I personally like the age 25. I think that's a good age uh, for people to specify uh, what happens and uh, a person 18 year old I mean come no, on it's like too if, young. I, if somebody gave me a ton of money when I was 18 and I was a responsible kid but uh, if somebody gave me a ton of money when I was 18 I probably wouldn't be sitting as a lawyer in this chair so you said revocable trust so revocable means you could revoke it meaning okay. you could change it however you want while you're alive Okay. When you when you pass, it becomes irrevocable. Okay. Now some people set up irrevocable trusts initially. They're done usually for a very different purposes. Some of them are done. Uh, uh, irrevocable trust means you can't change it anymore. Uh, right. Meaning, so if you own the house, if you own the bank accounts, and you put them into a trust, uh, the trustee is in uh, charge of that. You can mm -hmm. no longer come to the trustee and say, hey, trustee, I want to keep the house. I want to keep living there. The trustee could say, no, you're out. Like, I mean, it's rare that we're talking about, but this is what we as lawyers do. We 
think about the what if scenario, right, the, right. the every possible what unlikely, are the risks? Yeah, right. That's what I want. Because to know. I don't want my clients to be one of the thousands that makes it into the law books as an example of what happens. None of yeah. us do. Yeah. Uh, so irrevocable trusts are generally irrevocable for a number of reasons. Some of there's some benefits with irrevocable trusts for long-term Medicaid, okay. Medicare. I'm sorry. Uh, care and uh, Medicaid, Medicaid care, and other times it's done as a guardianship against creditors because mm-hmm. creditors could reach a revocable trust because you're still in charge of it. Okay. So the creditors say, "Well, what? Why should we not touch it? Like you, you can give us this money. You're in charge of it. Mm-hmm. Irrevocable trust, the creditors cannot because you're no longer in charge of it. The trustee is, but that comes with its own." set of issues what issues well if the trustee doesn't want to give you money if the trustee uh, wants to kick you out you of the house be sure you better the right, the you trustee, better yes. take the right trustee generally people who do revocable trusts have a very close family relationship with their children where mm-hmm. they know that their children are going to honor their wishes and not because legally they can't do anything mm-hmm. uh they they're they're legally the trustees in charge of everything okay interesting so to to sum it up and kind of give your take on it is from what my understanding is is when you want to protect and make make it easier for your heirs uh, when you pass is putting your assets well let's talk talk about just the real estate right now because I don't want to get into bank accounts and stuff like that that's not my forte but uh, uh, a home you would want to set up uh, a trust in such a way with a will uh, in such a way where when you're gone uh, it's uh, it's it's easier uh, to to process your wishes and for your heirs to obtain uh, let's say uh, power and ownership over the property and and have choices and can can execute their choices as they please without getting too much into the court system that am that, i understanding that is correct that, yeah. that's usually correct the trust certainly accomplishes that much easier uh, another way to do that is called a quit claim deed meaning while the person is alive they transfer ownership to maybe their son and their daughter, because uh, let's say they do have a will and they have two kids. Chances are that's who they want to leave everything to. They want to leave everything Mm -hmm. to their son and their daughter uh, if they don't have a spouse. If you have a spouse, you cannot disinherit a spouse. You cannot disinherit a spouse in New York, New Jersey. You can't disinherit a spouse in any state at all. Uh, So even if you don't like your spouse... (laughs) You have too bad. Uh, too bad. You have to leave them something. Uh, but uh, what what could be done is while that person is alive, let's say they have a son and a daughter, and they know that the son and the daughter will inherit the property anyway. So what they will do is while they're alive, they'll sign the property over to their son and their daughter, and then the deed will be recorded, and they will own it right away. They, so when mm-hmm. the person dies, I mean, again, we're talking about you need to have that close family relationship yeah. because we hear stories That's all, important, all, all over the place that, you know, son is suing mother, mother is... Uh, well, trying. I think it's called trust for a reason. <laughs> because technically the son and the daughter could tell the mother or the father, it's yeah. our house now, get out. Yeah, but I generally mean, it doesn't yeah. happen. You need a very, it's a very rare instance. But yeah. you want to make sure that that's, uh, you know, you generally they will allow the elder parent to live out their years in the home. But when the home, uh, when that person passes away, the home could be sold off very quickly uh, because they are already the owners on the Yes, record. so they, right. So that's the whole point is avoiding that part which is the probate so just hypothetically and i know you can't say for sure but what would one expect how long would a probate take as far as timelines and how much money can it cost i know everybody charges different rates but like 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 a rough idea so yeah so probate would roughly take around nine months to finish to finish probate 
meaning not not to get those letters. The letters we can yeah, get quickly. Fast. But mm -hmm. if you're the beneficiary of a will and not to get that money from the sale of the house, it has to go through this process mm -hmm. and you have to wait for it until it's yes. distributed to you. Uh, cost wise, I would say probably from twenty five to five thousand dollars, twenty five hundred to five thousand dollars. It's not that expensive, it's very time consuming. There's a lot of filings that need to be done. This was so much great information, such valuable information. And I know I've learned a lot. I know you've learned a lot. And I know that now you are a little bit or a lot more informed than before you started watching this video. If you have any questions for myself or David, you want to ask them in private, you can email them to keeping it real with a sphere. I will put that link for you in the description. But if you feel that you want to ask your questions right here in public, make sure you put them in the comments. Make sure to like this video, share it with your friends and family and subscribe to this channel. I work really hard for you to bring you some valuable, amazing information that I know is important and I know that you want to know. So thanks for watching and I'll see you on the next video.